Hello, I'm Commissioner Thomas Hicks, Vice Chair of the United States Election Assistance Commission. The EAC annually holds the National Clearinghouse Awards, also known as the Cleary Awards, to recognize best practices in election administration. This year, the EAC commissioners are interviewing some of the 2020 Cleary winners to learn more about their best practices and hard work that went into their award-winning programs. Today, I'm pleased to speak with Julie Wise, Director of Elections for King County, Washington, and Peg Pearl, Deputy Director for Elections for Arapahoe County, Colorado. King County won a 2020 Cleary Award for outstanding innovation in elections for their Voter Education Fund program, and the Arapahoe County Clerk and Recorder Office won a 2020 Cleary Award for outstanding innovation in elections for the curbside ballot pickup program. Congratulations, Ms. Wise and Ms. Pearl. Thank you for speaking with us today. Um, to start, um, I want to go back and forth. So, um, um, Ms. Wise, if you could start, uh, can you give us a brief overview of your Cleary Award winning program? Well, thank you very much, um, Thomas, and to the whole entire commission for this recognition. Myself and the team at King County Elections um, are really honored to receive um, this recognition. The Voter Education Fund is a first of its kind program where you have public philanthropic and community partnership. So that focus for the fund is increasing voter participation and civic engagement among some of the most historically excluded communities. Um, you know, its development came from the understanding of I think a few main things. First, there is a deep history in every community across the country of excluding voters in marginalized communities and King County is not immune from that problem. Second, sometimes we, as the election officials, um, we're not always the best messengers, right, to reach people, both because of simple capacity, but also because of people's trust or lack of trust in our government. And then finally, there are already incredible grassroots, nonprofit community organizations that are um, trusted in their respective communities and working in these underrepresented communities in a variety of ways. So the Voter Education Fund really helps us get out the vote, um, supporting these grassroots communities um, that are already putting in that hard work and have established relationships within um, their communities and with the resources that they need. So we're actually funding it with money dollars back into those community-based organizations. And you know, the focus is really about um, you know, the, the BIPOC communities, people um, experiencing homelessness, formerly incarcerated individuals, limited English speaking communities, people with disability, disabilities and young people, um, just to name a few. Great, great. Ms. Pearl, can you tell us a little about your uh, award, your Cleary Award winning program? Sure, thank you, Commissioner Hicks. Um, we're happy to be here today and we worked here in Arapahoe County on uh, the curbside ballot pickup program um, starting in the June state primary in 2020 um, and then really ramped it up for November's election last year. Uh, Colorado is a state where we have all options and we send mail ballots to every voter. And we do have, you know, in our county, at least 93% of our voters who tend to use that mail ballot. But we also know from our community that the people who do need to come into our offices, it's because they either spoiled their mail ballot for some reason, um, there was some sort of change that had to happen, they're coming in to get a replacement of some sort. Um, and especially with going into the pandemic and having the June election, we were very concerned for people's public health and access to get that replacement ballot without having to come inside a building and put their health at risk. So we developed a, a system where a voter could call in to our voter helpline and schedule a reservation, an exact day and time where they would pull up in front of one of our vote centers into a specially marked parking spot. Um, and our bipartisan election judges would prepare a ballot packet for them, one of our mail ballot packets, and bring it out to their car. Um, at the car, they would check the voter's ID. You could only pick up your own ballot, not for anyone else. Um, and have you sign a receipt that you had received it, give the voter that ballot um, and then walk away. Um, and our voters had a chance that way to get a replacement ballot without having to put themselves at risk 
and without having to create additional traffic in our vote centers. That meant our vote centers in June, we could really keep for folks who needed to be inside the vote center for some reason, maybe using accessible voting equipment or our language interpretation services or other things without putting their health at risk. Um, and in fact, the combination of things led to the fact that in June alone, we did have less than 1% of our voters vote in person, which was great for public health reasons. Um, so we rolled the program over and we expanded it to even more locations and more days in November. We did this through the entire early vote process, um, all 15 days in November 2020 um, at multiple locations across the county. So basically, Similar to people at that point in November were very used to picking up groceries, picking up their lunch uh, curbside. We, they were just picking up their ballot. Um, and we did have total able to serve over 270 voters in this way. And we heard from the community that it wasn't just people who now because of COVID were afraid of coming inside, um, but some of our folks with disabilities who maybe were wheelchair bound or other um, mobility challenges really appreciated not having to get into a vote center just to pick up what we call ballots to go and then take it with them again. Um, so because of all of that feedback we got, um, we are extending the service permanently now and we'll be using it this year as well in our elections um, at certain vote centers across the county. And then we've gotten really good feedback also from candidates and parties um, because last year they heard from a lot of voters about concerns for safety as well. And they were happy that they could tell them there was an alternative service and all you had to do was pick up the phone and call and you got a personalized date and time appointment. That's great, that is great. Um, what challenges did you face in developing and implementing these programs? Yeah, I think any time that you're creating a brand new program, um, especially if you're the first to do it, right? No other election offices are doing it yet. There's bound to be some challenges. But, you know, I'll say with the Voter Education Fund that we've been so incredibly fortunate here in King County to have our leadership of the county. So both our elected executive and our King County Council, who really understood the importance of this program and, um, you know, and agreed to fund it year after year. We've been doing this program, we piloted it, which I think is a great way to um, see if something's you know, really gonna work out for your county is just put a pilot before it and um, give it a whirl. And we did that in 2016. It was really important to me that it's not something that we fund just during a presidential election year, but it's something that we continue to fund, especially here in King County and Washington state in our odd years where we have those local elections that are incredibly critical as well. So to have that funding year after year, um, as well as our community partners who are willing to put in this hard work um, as they do a lot of other work in our community um, and to help us flush out what this vision was gonna be and how the structure that worked um, for both us as government entity and for them as nonprofits. Great, great. Ms. Pearl? Yes, so we were trying to create a whole new program and service that hadn't been used before here um, on a very short timeline. Um, and so if you sat a bunch of us in a, in a room and gave us this idea, we could spin it out in a whole bunch of different ways um, and very elaborate in terms of the implementation. Uh, but we knew that we needed to just be very lean and mean and, and make it work because of timelines and um, there wasn't something that we had budgeted for five years ago for elaborate IT development, for example, for some sort of unique program. Um, so one of our challenges was when we wanted to make sure people could make a reservation, we didn't want them to have to call and talk to five different people or get passed around. Um, so we had just people call the voter hotline number, which they knew about and was already plastered over everything that we put out, the same phone number everyone's used to. And then we took on the labor in the back end of how do we communicate that information now to the proper vote center so that they are ready and waiting when that voter shows up. Um, and so we created the back end communication. Um, and again, the lean mean version was just a Google shared spreadsheet between the people answering the phones in one location and the people working at the vote center at the other location. And they could see, oh, now we have an appointment on Tuesday at noon, we better be ready for that person when they come. 
Um, but that was definitely one of the challenges to overcome was how to get that communication link together in a quick way um, and in an accurate way so that that information could be conveyed between the two different groups of people needed to implement the program. Great, 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 great. Um, Ms. Pearl, you had talked a little bit about this already when you answered the first question, but can you expand on the feedback that you got from voters or election staff? Um, yes, absolutely. And this was important to us because we did the same thing that Julie was talking about. We tried it in our June election, called it a pilot, and then asked people, what do you think? Is this useful? Should we use it in the big election in November? Um, and so we heard from some of those voters that I told you about with disabilities, used it in June and said, yes, definitely, I will tell my friends about it. And we heard from candidates and parties that people were looking for an option, uh, some way to keep themselves safe, and that they were afraid that if something happened and they needed a replacement ballot, their choice was just going to be, well, I can't vote now. I'm out of luck. And we never want that to be the option. So we wanted to make sure that we had that ability for folks. Um, so part of the voter feedback and feedback with the community was talking about where we had them in the county. We wanted to make sure they were geographically spaced um, and making sure that the access and hours, um, those types of issues, the things that we had tried in June, what worked well, what didn't, and that really helped us put the program in place for November. And again, we took the temperature of folks after November, talking to our municipal clerks, to candidates and parties and voters, and their positive feedback is what led us to now fold it in as a permanent service. Great, great. Uh, Ms. Wise, would you like to talk about the feedback you got from voters and uh, election staff? You know, the team here at King County Elections is so deeply committed to ensuring, you know, that everyone has a voice. Um, it's one of my favorite, favoritest things among many of that team. Um, there's no question that removing barriers, therefore increasing access, is a value held by all of the uh, 70 staff members here at King County Elections. I'm so privileged to work with them, um, with so many people that are as passionate about voting as I am. And, you know, I hear from our staff regularly that they're proud to work in an elections department that prioritizes a program like the Voter Education Fund. You know, our voters have been overwhelmingly supportive as well and positive about the Voter Education Fund. You know, with just about anything, you're always going to have some naysayers, um, so don't get me wrong, but our voters really seem to really get why a program like the Voter Education Fund is needed and why we should focus time on making sure that everyone can make their voices heard. So since 2018, the Voter Education Fund partners have reached, got some data here, because you know us election geeks, how much we love the data, <laughs> nearly 900,000 voters across the county. They've registered almost 18,000 people, and they've held almost 5,500 community events focused on both voter registration and the education. So getting registered and turning out to vote. And you know, that kind of reach is incredible. You know, we simply with running four elections a year don't have the bandwidth to be able to do that. Um, and it's enabled people who would not have gotten registered and who would not have had their voices heard otherwise um, to have their voices heard. So uh, it's a crucial program we believe in in King County. Um, and again, we're thrilled to be recognized for, for this work. Great. Um, you both have talked about continuing these programs in the future, but where do you do you see where do you see this going in the future as well? Um, either one of you want to start answering that? So I'll start. Um, we are working on kind of the permanent implementation of the program now, and part of what we're doing with that is we're going to fully fold it into our ballot instructions and all of the materials that we send out. Um, right now, for example, when you get a listing in your ballot instructions of all the locations to vote, we have icons for whether it's in-person voting, a drop-off box, we're going to create a new icon that's for curbside ballot pickup. So we're implementing it in there. Um, and we're looking at basically having it, again, like Julie said, it's important in all elections, not just presidential. So this year, we have city council elections, school board elections in November, some statewide ballot measures. 
Um, we're going to have it implemented at our three busiest, largest vote centers scattered at three points in our county. Um, even though it's technically a small election, we wanna make sure it's an important service for this important election as well. Um, so we're implementing that in those locations. We'll have even more communication to folks as a public as permanent service. And we're working on the back end a little bit. I think we might, our IT department has some ideas. You get the IT a year to think about it. And I think we're gonna have something a little different than a Google spreadsheet by November. That sounds awesome. Ms. Wise? Commissioner Hicks, uh, you asked me if we're gonna continue to do this program. Absolutely is the answer. Um, in fact, the application period, we are now on a two year funding cycle. It provides less stress on those organizations and internally to be able to look through those grants and for people to also know that they can depend on that funding for two years. So we just closed the application process um, earlier this month. We're excited to review those applications, but then comes the hard part is that you have to not pick all 70 applicants. We're gonna to have to make hard decisions about who we do fund. Um, so we're gonna review those applications in partnership with the Seattle Foundation, which is the philanthropic group that is um, matching the funding of King County elections. And um, we're awarding $950,000 in grants for this two year period. Um, so sometime during the month of May, we will announce those next round of grantees and get to work with them. Oh, I think when amazing. you look about in the future, you know, we're going to continue to work with our community and continue to look at what the data shows us of where we're not seeing people um, turning out, um, working with our marginalized communities to see um, how best we, we engage and, um, and look forward to that work. I, I think that there was a lot of excitement around this election, but I, I don't think it's by accident that you see Colorado and Washington and other states have some of the highest voter turnout. In King County, we had 87% turnout for our presidential election. Wow, that is truly amazing. What recommendations would you give other jurisdictions, especially those that are smaller than yours, if they want to implement a similar program? Ms. Watt? Yeah. Start. I'm sure I'm sure when people hear $950,000 in grant awards, they're thinking I could never do that. We don't have the budget. And I totally get it. That's understandable. And that's true for many of my colleagues, um, not only across the country, but in Washington state as well. You know, but when we break that $950,000 down, what we're talking about are grants anywhere from $5,000 to $40,000 to nearly 40 organizations. And I would argue that even smaller grant amounts can go a long way to building capacity for those organizations to do critical voter education work. So, you know, and the outside of the money, I think some of the most valuable pieces that we provide are community-based organizations, those partners come in the form of information is trainings and the materials, right? So one of the biggest things that we do is we provide technical support. We host monthly trainings on a variety of topics from the do's and don'ts of voter registrations, the laws in which we need to navigate within, to filing for office, to the basics use of social media for voter education. So we make sure they have access to voter registration forms, in any kind of guides or materials that we're um, already producing. So those kind of things can also go a long way. Um, it doesn't have to just be money to helping community-based organizations to extend um, that critical message um, that um, uh, getting out the vote. Wow. Ms. Pearl? I think my recommendation is to take a look at um, your voters and what types of things they need, where they already are, um, how are they voting and where are there things that you could do little tweaks that could actually make a big difference in some voters life. Um, so again, we implemented this using our existing voter phone numbers an existing Google spreadsheet, existing election judges who were already sitting at a vote center who already knew how to print mail ballot packets. The only difference is they walked out to the parking lot instead of having the voter come into the room. So small tweaks on our side, but it makes a huge difference to a voter who either has a major health risk and is afraid of something like COVID or is using a wheelchair or 
is a working mom with a sleeping toddler in a car seat who does not want to unbuckle them and wake them up just to come inside. Because I've been there and that is not good. And this makes a huge difference in your day in whether or not the voter is going to make that stop and get that ballot and if they're going to vote. So thinking about where the voters are and what they're doing and what little tweaks you can do that actually don't cost a lot on your end and adjust your existing processes can really have an outsized impact on the individual voters themselves. And so I think that's really the most important thing because most of us are here doing this work because we're all about making sure the voter gets that ballot, turns it in and feels good about the process. And that's just exactly what it's about. And so that's how, it's not about how much money you have, it's about how you can do that process for that voter in that moment. Truly amazing. Is there anything else that either of you would like to add before we um, start to close? <laughs> I think- Don't be afraid to ask, I guess is what <laughs> I would say. You know, sometimes you kind of go, I don't know if this makes sense. And it's kind of just so far out there that um, I think those innovative approaches, those sort of like, whenever your team comes to you saying, I have a horrible idea, they're usually the best idea, right? I mean, so don't be afraid to ask and to, and to get creative, which it sounds like, obviously, um, election officials know a little bit something about. <laughs> and exactly. I would say just talk to the non-election official friends and family people you know as well, because one of them might just have a very practical perspective idea, like, well, why don't I just pick up something like I pick up my dinner to go? And they don't know the election side of it, but you and your team can turn that into an election administration program if it's valid. Um, but keep an eye out to talk to just your friends and family and their observations about the process as well. Great. I wanna thank you both for one, your service to our country, but two, service to your counties and, and state and the, the innovative ideas that you've um, implemented here that truly are award-winning. And I wanna congratulate you again for winning these 2020 Clery Awards for those um, innovative programs. And I look forward to actually uh, um, presenting you with a plaque in person someday. Uh, but in, in the meantime, you know, hopefully uh, we'll see each other soon. But um, thank you again for all your hard work and um, sharing your ideas here today. Um, and hopefully other counties and jurisdictions will, will implement some of these ideas in their uh, in their, for their programs as well. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Hicks.